Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are new here, please feel free to hit that like button and subscribe and ring that bell for notifications for all new videos that I post. Today we got something really special for you. Uh, myself, I teamed up with a friend of mine who's also a YouTuber. He goes by the name Catterday Night on YouTube. I'll put the link in the description and it should be below right here. And uh, he's been doing a lot of retro movie reviews and uh, giving his thoughts on all sorts of movies over the years. We go back. We've been friends for a really long time. We live in two different areas now. But we decided to sort of team up on our mutual love for Die Hard 3. That's right, Die Hard 3. We feel like it doesn't get the respect and the love that the original one has. We feel like this is a sequel that we both love. It was way better than it needed to be. And uh, we decided to do a, our first video where we sort of teamed up, explain, discuss, and just talk uh, about why we love this movie. So sit back and get ready to watch our take on why we love Die Hard 3. Retro Movie, movie Review. Review. So, what's it been, a year and a half? It's been at least a couple months, and I'm fully to blame. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I sat through. I sat through prison the first attempt and took notes of the oh, horribly that was, old. Was it Rennie Harlan? It was. We thought that was going to be cool, and that turned out to be a shit show for a lot of different reasons. Didn't Rennie Harlan do? Was he? Did he do Die Hard Two? What was he the one did that he did? Two. And yes. He's actually credited with making one of the more exciting Elm Street movies, The Dream Warriors. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those few sequels that really stands out. I mean, the uh, I mean, part two is always a lot of fun, you know, because when we're all younger, we're like, oh, this has nothing to do with homosexuality. Right, right. We're good friends. Freddie really likes him. Like, nah, that's Robert Englund says it's a romance terrorism kind of thing. <laughs> Just torturing him. I remember when Die Hard 2 first came out, I really wasn't that much of a fan of that one. Well, so... I thought maybe we should, if this is going to our respective whatevers, I thought yeah. maybe it'd be funny to banter about us working there. I think we both started in the very late 80s, like 89. No, I was I was 93. So I was there. Okay. Yeah, so, so I was there for Die Hard 3. I served that summer. Okay. So I just remember the very first thing that was in the theaters when I was there was Gremlins 2. <laughs> when I first started. So that's how old I am and how long ago that was. So when we were working there, so yeah, I, I started, um, it was the, f so Jurassic Park opened on a Wednesday and I started on that Friday. Okay. So that was like, Very you know, exciting. thrown into the fire. Cause that summer we had Jurassic Park, we had Rising Sun, we had Fugitive. They did a re-release of Snow White. They had Hocus oh, Pocus wow. a few months later. You have a way better memory than me, man. Wow. Yeah, hey, I was I was behind the front lines, or I was in concession. I forget where you were doing. I think you're already doing projection by then. Uh, probably, it's, I was already there for. A couple but of yeah, years. it was. So I mean, I I consider that as you know when people say that they like worked at some toy store when Elmo came out, and like, well, I worked at a movie theater when Jurassic Park came out. I served that summer. I was there for Demolition Man. I was there for, uh, I think Mrs. Doubtfire was within a year of that, too. One All of the, the only uh, things I remember from working there that was, like, funny to watch unfold was Home Alone comes out the same weekend as Dances with Wolves, and they thought Dances with Wolves was going to sell out, and Home Alone was going to do nothing. It was, pe it was already pegged as a bomb. Yeah. And then I remember scrambling to move things to bigger theaters and right back when they had to carry those big heavy. Oh, yeah. It was like between five and eight reels of that stuff. Uh, we were working there. It was still eight, right? I mean, we saw that. Yeah, it, yeah, it was eight. Them. And then yeah. I think in, um, I don't know, I think it was out. Yeah, I think by the time Die Hard 3 came out, we'd expanded it to 20 because okay. I think it had. It was either that summer of 95 or maybe it was later in 95 because I remember us getting prints for like GoldenEye and a bunch of like rerun stuff to fill up the mm. other side. But so so my first memory of Die Hard 3 was actually um, I remember sitting in the theater with a friend of mine. And the and the first thing I remember is them trying a, them uh, playing a trailer for Bad Boys. And so Bad Boys, a trailer, you know, it shows everything, all the big explosions, everything kind of winds down to black screen. 
my friend, she just says, I can't wait for that movie to come out. <laughs> says it really loud. And she's like, this is totally the crowd for that between Die Hard 3 and this. But like I said, like, you know, when we're talking about, you know, looking at some older directors like Rennie Harlan, you know, with part two, I, I didn't really care for part two at the time. So I was surprised they were even making a part three. Right. I agree with you. And I think we're sort of in the minority on that. I think a lot of people love, like I, it, to me now it's different. Like, I don't care that, you know, the same thing ends up happening to him, you know, on Christmas day. Like could the same thing happen to see you guys twice. But back when I was like jaded and everything had to be like completely original. Like, oh, this is stupid. I didn't like it as much. I didn't like when he pulls the ejection seat and his face comes right to the camera like, yeah. I, I, and lighting the oh. lighting the trail of gasoline and blowing. I hate. I didn't like all that. It felt too almost Bugs Bunny ish. I don't know what it was. I just didn't I didn't like, like seeing the seeing the dad from Good Times being a bad guy. That that really yeah. shook me up. John Amos. But uh, so I don't watch uh, two uh, repeatedly. One is one, and one yeah, one is like a holiday one. classic. But not only that, it's just. The, it's one of those movies that for the better part of the rest of it since has been copied or is compared to that is so rare it's a it's a matrix of its day before that came out yeah exactly a slew when, of movies after that uh that what's the one with uh steven seagal on the ship like there's a bunch of it awesome doesn't even movies. matter which one he's on the ship it's all the same freaking movie whether but it's out for justice out. or leaning on ponytail or whatever he wants to call it it's all nonsense that's right <laughs> because also with with the first Die Hard, you know this was coming out when he was on moonlighting you know and it was like they didn't even want to put him on the poster and it was kind of a joke that he's going to be in this action movie and it went well and then you know he was still doing moonlighting for a little bit and doing talking baby movies and then they spring part two on us and it does all right and then we get another talking baby movie and it's like you know they threw all these crazy things out there some of them worked some didn't you know i had like last boy scout didn't do well um i think bonfire of the vanities didn't but uh there's yeah, a it was movie. strange there's a movie i wish i did a little bit more research on that it, he's with sarah jessica parker it is so bad called strike force or strike through it's so bad i did and i just remember that from a long time ago like it's a weird yeah, so it was weird oh yeah it's it was i just remember going oh it's like speed too bad like nowadays it seems like if a movie doesn't do well they just scrap the entire franchise i mean you look at the mummy or green lantern they were both they had their good points you know but they definitely fell flat and then they just start sh like oh we're going to shut down dark universe we're going to shut down another green lantern instead of just doing another film to get it right but Back then, they would say, well, Die Hard 2 didn't do as well, but we can win him back. Let's throw Samuel L. Jackson in it since he was just in Pulp Fiction with him. We can ride off that fame. But not only that, but they brought back the original director. And he's, Ooh. you know, McTiernan has done what he, he also did, like Predator and a bunch of stuff. I think uh, uh, Last Hunt Action Hero. What did I write here? I have notes. I wrote notes when I watched mine. Oh, here we go. Die Hard, Hunt for Red October, Last Action Hero, the remake of Thomas Crown Affair. And his last movie was called Basic in 2003, which I believe is John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. let me see here. You know, he didn't really stick around. Like, his name is, like, is really remembered, but he hasn't really done that much in general. Well, I think that these guys are old. Like, a lot of the people that we, first of all, these are from an era where I don't think a lot of people, like, remember every single director's name. We right. sort of gravitated towards that because of what, that job had done to us, which still yeah. affects me to this day. I actually told Karen, my wife, like we were watching Top Gun, the, the new one. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, it's so weird to be this giddy about a summer movie. Like, I'm so, it's so weird. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, and it's weird because with, you know, like I said, with Die Hard 3, I wasn't really that excited. It looked like it was just going to be a cash grab to throw Samuel L. Jackson in because he's getting popular. But um, I was surprised because, so there were a few things in it. I mean, they right away throw you right into the action. You know what I mean, just starting off with an explosion. So it doesn't play itself to be anything other than there's going to be big explosions and people racing through the city. And don't complain if the story isn't that deep. Right. But the story, you know, it does seem like it could have been it could have been any other action movie. They just threw in his name. They put his wife's name on or her voice on the phone. And then they just changed, you know, had one of the characters be the, the brother of the bad guy from the first one. So it could have been any other action movie. But it probably would have still done just as well. But being able to pull people back that it's a sequel to Die Hard, pulling some other actors, I think it got a lot more people in there to, to see that story. But I thought they did a good job with it as far as how, you know, the motivation behind this character, 
you know, and trying to steal all this money and destabilize nations and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, because I felt like with part two, it didn't really, it didn't really grab me as much. This one somehow pulled me in a lot more. Well, what I like about it, A, yes, it throws you right in. You already know these people and it doesn't, the whole plot doesn't reveal itself in the first 10 minutes. Like you don't get why he's after it. They don't even reveal that it's his brother until way late in the movie. Like, yeah, it's, it's like a good 40 or 50 yeah, minutes I was about to say in. 40 right? minutes in before that, but there's some great, but I could, you know, breadcrumbs, like they make reference in the background of the dump trucks and, and like all this stuff. And it's sort of a, like said in the background, not really brought attention to. And then it all slowly starts to become this thing. Quite honestly, that's like a lost art. Like there's not a lot of breadcrumb leaving these days in a lot of movies. A lot of it, if you don't get to satisfy me in 11 minutes, it's craziness. And yeah, they're they just going to toss it. And even, and even the stuff that by the time, you know, it kind of unravels more that the whole thing about it being revenge for his brother, even that was just a distraction. Just like, oh, if I can grab this guy, get the police freaking out about this, it's going to confuse the entire situation and, you know, they'll get away with everything. But yeah, it was, um, and of course, you know, the explosions and, and how they work, you know, that it's this different kind of stuff, that goo that's like a, like an epoxy in a way, you know, where you need to have those, those two parts and I guess how dangerous it is and everything. But, uh, and of course, just that action. I mean, racing through Central Park like that, running people over. And pre- pre 11 so the twin towers are in there even my son noticed that he's like whoa I'm like yeah this is a different it's like if you put it in that kind of context that's a crazy different era first of all there was no like digital effects that didn't even exist when this came out so yeah if you were doing digital the, effects it was sci-fi and no they didn't the subway, throw that in that scene with the blowing up the subway that is insane how detailed that is oh yeah i mean all of it like in those freaking car chases just little things like ripping out the fuses to get rid of the anti-lock brakes and spinning around shooting people flipping everything over driving through the park are you aiming for these people exactly i love, it. I love the banter i love how samuel L. jackson is introduced I just I even you know, love how the freaking uh, dump truck dump truck driver was just like this trivia nerd. He's giving all this information about New York like he's a tour guide. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, like you said, all those little all those little crumbs, you know, like the uh, like having the the quarters for the tolls. The dump it mentioned that the dump trucks were stolen just in passing, as far as other crimes happening that day. You know, then when he uh, like there were there were like a few other things kind of tossed in there. But of course, the the thing that really stuck out afterwards, uh, that person I went to see the movie with, I had to have her explain to me the the water jug situation. I still I still bog, blows my mind with some of that stuff. I'm not a math guy, so it's still I watched that and I'm just like, man, all this time later, I'm still not quite there i mean i sort of get it now but i'm still like oh i would be, i'd be dead if it were me the city would blow up because it's my fault because I exactly can't and you'd just be standing there with two jugs like well, would, this it, one's five yeah. and this one's three how am i supposed to get four i would be like oh i'm so bad at this i am sorry new york city yeah it's actually a pretty simple thing i, I remember it once okay you got the three and you got the five you fill up the five pour it into the three now you've got two and three now dump out those three take the two that's left put that into the three now, when you fill up that five, you can only fit one more gallon in the three. So when you pour that in, you get four left. So you, so you can't figure that out while a bomb is ticking and people are screaming all around you? Right, right. After racing through a park? Come on. Let's Everybody not, can. Let's not forget that this one, instead of being confined, which has been sort of the, the thing of the first two, they open it up. It's like letting like the rats out of the cage to use New York City as their playground and I, I that's another thing I like and I, at the time you don't really realize that at least I didn't like you don't looking back you're like oh my god they're taking this guy that's been sort of held in these weird confined areas and now he, they're using all of the city it's just genius I just you know you watch some of these things with different eyes and you wonder like how would this play with the terrorizing of school children and, and like oh, yeah. and Samuel L. Jackson's character like all these things are up for media uh, people just rail on these things now like oh agendas and this and that i i don't i don't ever remember watching stuff like with that kind of thing i, I don't know maybe yeah it's like everybody everybody jumps on it now like oh there's a special hidden agenda with it no other reason they just want to make some money by blowing shit up and that's what they do they blow it up we pay money it's fun you know <laughs> i mean, just think of like when he wears that sandwich board think yeah. of, if they did that today like <laughs> there would 
people be screaming. I'm Even surprised he hasn't point. been canceled for that. It's like, remember point. you did that movie 25 years ago, 27 years ago. We're going to cancel you now. For that. I tell my son, who's a big Office fan, I'm like, dude, it's a good thing I bought you those on DVD. I said, because your day's coming. They're going to start exactly. pulling those episodes. It's really, it's really weird because... I mean, I know with the sandwich board thing, it makes sense for the story, but a lot of people will see it and say, oh, it went too far. But that's the whole point. He has to have something on him that goes too far, that gets him in trouble and distracts them from what these guys are doing. Like, that's all it is. And it works. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like, I, oh, they said something insensitive. I'm like, yeah, they're trying to insult them. It's what, <laughs> it's what gets these two polar opposites together and then the rest of the really from that point the rest of the movie is kind of just fast paced like boom and it yeah. moves and yeah I, just, I don't know if it's it too soon keeps going i don't know if it's too soon to talk about the my favorite part that elevator scene from the time, first time i saw it till the time that i saw it just a couple weeks ago Flat I right still on still love it i love it how they kept referencing the badge number before that hit and then he catches on and it's, I know I've heard people compare it to, oh, if you think this scene in Civil War is good, I still, I told my, my son like, this is so good to me. And to, for me, it was, that was a very hard R rating. Like I hadn't seen a movie that quite showed that much violence. Yeah, like, I was way into like, there. I was like into the, you know, foreign films and I got, you got into a lot of like, Japanese, you know, more than those are really violent. This was the first time I'd seen like especially all the horror like, stuff, like the Peter a, Jackson an stuff. Action movie where he puts his hand in front of Bow! I was just like, holy smoke. That was just crazy to me. I still love that whole thing. I mean, it's just dare I say, chef's kiss. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, yeah, and it was it was a nice scene because it's interesting if you look at um like reaction videos for this movie and i always like seeing what somebody who's new to the movie thinks of it whether they're just watching it to give commentary or if there's somebody who really gets wrapped up in it when they see that scene it's like they catch on right when we did and we're watching it when the guy gets turns and then you see that number and it's like oh wait that guy was talking about his number and playing those numbers every week that's so good so and, and you wouldn't expect that from an action movie because a lot of stuff leading up to this throughout the 80s was just spraying the screen with bullets and, and that was pretty much it. And then it's like once they started getting out of the 80s, they tried to mix it up some because you already had, you know, along the way, they're already starting to make fun of that. And that's how you get movies, you know, like Last Action Hero to kind of poke that, you know, through that fourth wall. So this one started working more towards like if they if they put in some more plot lines that are closer to like a spy film or a real heist film instead of simply an action film, you're going to give this other depth to it, which then green lights, what, two other sequels? Three, I think. Yeah. So that's where I sort of fall off. Like I remember seeing, I think it was four. I don't even know how many they have now. Like you said, I, I think it was four, it was like several, like years went by before they made a fourth, right? Like, yeah, it was like a, like a decade. And then there's like a, there's one where he's, feels like he becomes a superhero sort of before superheroes became an every week thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's not cool. I don't know. Even though he technically is a superhero this whole time, mm -hmm. uh, looking back, you know, but I love when my heroes get all bloodied and messed up. Like there's, there's something to that that I've always loved, even to this day in movies. Like I don't want them to come out all pristine. I think we're past that anyway, but love that. Did, have, did you see anything about the original ending and how that was supposed to go? Have you, did you see? No, that no, that was the other thing, just that that big twist. You know, they, it's like they put step after step after step to get people off their tail. You know, like even though it should be fine by this point, should be fine by this point, they still had all those plans to just, no matter what, they're going to throw all that stuff to drop them. So then at that end there where he realizes, oh, this is all just a misdirection. It was a nice twist thrown in there. That's the uh, Fort Knox. Ha! Ah, it's for tourists! I exactly. love that stuff. <laughs> love it. But they, um... Yeah, it was, uh, looking it up here, it was um, 12 years until they made the next Die Hard movie, Live Free or Die Hard. Yeah. And remember I Justin remember Long. a tiny, yeah, had Justin Long, I know Kevin Smith had a part in it for some reason, had something to do with like internet shutting down everything like power and water, whatever. But again, if you have to think back on it and try to figure out what it was, and I know I've seen the movie two or three times and okay. 2007 was not that long ago. <laughs> Right. I, I only saw that once. And I think it's the one where there's a big semi and he's like almost riding on top of it, like a surf 
surfboard or something like to get it to stop or something like that. That's in my head. And then the, the one I did like is there's one where the car flips and hits this like bridge partition goes bam right into it. Oh that yeah, was cool. But I, and I know remember. he did that. I got um, the whole collection sitting right here. That's how I. Well, yeah, like I've got I've got a good day to die hard, and I don't think I've watched it. I think I got ten minutes in and couldn't stay interested and just mm -hmm. ducked out. Like oh, one day I'll rewatch it. Still haven't rewatched it. Now um, it just is. And it, when originally when we tried to put this whole thing together is because diagnosed with this aphasia thing. That's a yeah. whole that's a whole other sad thing where we're gonna start seeing our movie heroes withering away due to just age and stuff. And that's gonna be a bummer, dude, because he's more than just diehard. Some great films there. Yeah, already is weird when I was watching uh, Little Nikita last year and then like two months later Sidney Poitier dies. I'm like, oh geez, like I just watched a movie with him, and then you realize. Well, yeah, he was like 90 years old. 90. You no, know, it's not like, it's not like when like somebody who's like 27 or 35 dies, you're kind of surprised. Like, well, 90, that was a long no, run. It was a good run. That's what happens. The one that shocked me just the other day with Ray Liotta. I mean, mm -hmm. Goodfellas is crazy to me. It was, yeah, it was what, like most, 64 all movie I've ever or something? Seen. 67, filming a movie. Mm -hmm. where he was asleep, but I guess passed away in his sleep. Oof. Yeah, that's some crazy stuff. It's uh, it is weird because I remember when I was younger thinking it's going to be strange when I'm my parents' age and because they always talk about oh this person died oh that person died. Yeah. It's like once around 2015 came everybody just started dropping like flies. You know we lose like Lemmy, Prince, and Bowie all within two months. <laughs> you yeah. know like the late uh, 2015, early 2016 or whatever, and then it's just like man you start like one to like gather around all these celebrities like keep them safe keep them from yeah, getting sick i mean time is the great it it even i mean it sucks it sucks to watch these dudes get old i don't the weird part is i feel as immature as ever those birthdays don't lie <laughs> exactly it's, it's yeah i think that something like Die Hard 3 wouldn't happen nowadays because even though we have more theaters it's just I don't know, they'd make it for so amazon much content prime. it would be an amazon prime exclusive yeah and That's and now we're going to get into that two old men territory where we're like, I mean, I want, did you see that Chris Pratt movie that's on Amazon? The yeah, Tomorrow I saw that one. one. Like, it's yeah. really good. I'm like, I'm never going to get to see this in the theater. Like, it's not going to, that's a weird thing. And it's crazy. I think we're, I'm hoping that they don't lean into the streaming too much that they, that they at least, you know, give a reason to go. Like some of these movies, maybe they're not worth spending 12 bucks to see, but you know, you should be able to pop in there for five bucks and see something. It should be able to make more money off that. It's just since... Nobody seems to have any idea how streaming affects subscriptions, how they can tell if it's worth the investment. Because when I hear of Netflix, you know, paying $200 million to buy the rights for some show, I just don't understand how they justify that they've recouped that. I don't either, because it feels like you're watching it for free. In the grand right. scheme of life, you're paying $10 a month for 9,000 mm -hmm. shows. And for someone to tell me that Netflix doesn't have anything good on, I don't, I hate all that. I hate so then, you know, people have been like dropping the subscription. I don't understand what makes you do that unless you're taking the summer off or something. Yeah. But I don't like same thing with Amazon. Like I don't understand how you can make what looks like a two hundred dollar, two hundred million dollar movie with Chris Pratt and state of the art effects, and I feel like it's for free to me. Yeah. I mean, to to be able to watch a movie like that in my own home the night that it comes out is insane. Uh, and yeah. I have mixed feelings about that because we do have a tremendous setup. Like what we've got now, 75-inch yeah. screen and killer surround sound, that is amazing. And couches that remind me of the places that we went to when I lived in California. I mean, they're, it's comfortable. We've gone to theaters with less comfortable chairs than what yeah. we have. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, like, like what they do with these movies going forward, because I also feel like they don't really play the long game. They want to they want to flip it over as quickly as possible. And the moment that they don't get the result that they want, they'll cancel any possible projects. It's crazy to me to think that they produced and created and distributed Dune Part One without green lighting the second half of the story. Now, it came out and two weeks later, they greenlit the, the second part. But why would you even risk making half of a story? Like commit to both of them, and if the first one bombs, well, tough shit. You know, hopefully the next one will make up your money because it definitely won't make the money if you don't commit to the second one. That's they were sneaky about that one. I didn't know that it was only part one until I was sitting in the theater and it said part one. I was like, well, were they doing Children of Dune next? Did they commit to that? Because I don't trust that. <laughs> and that's one of those things that's not a guarantee. Oh, we have less than a minute. Ah, oh, jeez. 
But uh, all right, so what do we do? We give thumbs up for Die Hard, still holds up yeah, after all these years. Thumbs up. I'll, I'm just going to film an outro on mine whenever I go to, to edit all this. I'll do an intro and an outro and right. edit it all together. As will I. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the video. The way it ended, I want to apologize. Uh, it ended abruptly because as we were going on and on and on, we got the Zoom notification that we only had one minute left and we realized we didn't even give a proper outro to the video. The general consensus, definitely a thumbs up for Die Hard 3. Again, we thank you so much for tuning into our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring the bell for not only my channel, but also head on over to Catterday Night and also hit the, hit the like subscribe and ring the bell for his as well. He has been generating uh, a lot more content on a regular basis. Uh, please feel free to check out his collection on all the Hammer films that comes in a box set. He is posting quite frequently on all sorts of movie reviews and, and things like that. So feel free to check him out. Again, we thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you in the next one.